Let's go before the Lord in prayer together. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that as we open up your word, you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown tonight. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, tonight as we pray, lead us to pray as you would have us to. Holy Spirit, guide us. Direct our words and our thoughts and our emotions, our minds. God, we pray, Lord, that uh, we would pray in the will of God on the earth. Lord, we declare your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, not a man's, not, not a philosophy's, Lord, not a political system, God, but your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, we bless all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are meeting, God. Many have already met today, Lord, and Father, many are still meeting, God, and we pray, Lord, that you bless them as you would bless us. God, and we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We ask, God, that you be with them, encourage them, strengthen them, guide and guard and protect them, Lord. May they endure to the end. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. Tonight, get your Bibles and go with me to the book of Psalms. As you're turning there, I want to tell you a story. How did I get here? He asked himself as he sat down in the camp where he was spending the night. It had been a long day's hike to physically get where he was. But his question wasn't aimed at how he physically got there. It was aimed at his life situation. Was he still dealing with the effects of his adultery and his indiscretion? Yes, in in some ways he was, but this was deeper. This was new. This was fresh. Maybe he could have done things differently as a dad. He should have intervened. He should have stood up for what was right. He could have easily told the kids how it was going to be, and they would have gotten in line, but he didn't. Was it the neglect of his own father that made him absent when it came to his own children? Was it because he got lost in a crowd of older brothers? Why was it so hard to even have his own children over for dinner when they lived in the same city? It's no wonder my son hates me. And now everyone else is taking his side. Thoughts continued to race across his mind as he sat in that place, wanting to go to sleep and be at peace. And he found none. See, it was in this place that we find King David in the book of Psalms, the third chapter. You're there in the book of Psalms. Turn with me to Psalms, the third chapter. And in Psalms chapter number three, we find this man that we were just talking about. Psalm chapter three, starting out, says a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. That means pause. Take a moment and think about this for a second. Here's a man who is a man after God's own heart. Here's somebody who had pursued God. Here's somebody who had followed God. Here's somebody who had won battles. He had victories. He was the beloved of Israel. He had slain the giant. Saul had slain his thousands. David his tens of thousands. He had overcome. He'd been on the run, and yet he lived, and he lived in integrity. And yes, he messed up. Yes, he committed adultery. Yes, he tried to cover it up. And he paid a price for it. And the effects of that did linger on in his life. Even this instance with Absalom, there were things that took place that God had spoken to him beforehand. You did this in private, and then someone else of your own house will do this publicly. And we see that coming to pass in this instance. And yet here was David, and his own son had come against him. His own son had caught the hearts of the men of Israel. And now had declared himself to be king. And here's David on the run, camped out by himself. And he's saying, Lord, do you see this? Lord, do you you understand, God? There's so many people coming against me. God, they've risen up. And then he goes on and look at what it says in verse number three. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. See, even though he stopped and he thought about all the people that had risen up against him, now he's thinking about God. His thoughts start to change. You, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. Verse number four, I want you guys to key in on this. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. Stop and pause and think about this. 
Even though there's people on the rise, even though there's people that are hating on him, even though people from his own household, those that have been dearest to him, those that he should have, could have, would have done something differently with, even though all that's going on, God, you are my shield. God, you're my protector. God, you're the lifter of my head. God, I was downcast. I was discouraged. I was looking at the natural things. And yet, God, you took your hand and put it under my chin and you lifted up my head. I cried to the Lord, not just talked, not just said something. No, I cried out out of a desperation to the Lord. And God heard my cry. He doesn't even know that yet. He hasn't even seen the results of the battle that was about to take place. And yet by faith, he makes a statement and says, God, I cried out to you and you heard my cry. Verse number five, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. See, once he knew that God had heard his prayer, heard his cry, he could lay down and go to sleep. He had no problems having a good night's rest. Why? Because when God has heard your prayers, you know everything's going to be all right. God's going to take care of you in that time. A couple of things that I want to point out from Psalm chapter number three. I want to just draw a couple of things out of here. First is this, is that we need to share with God the troubles that have risen up. When people start hating on you, when life turns, when things go south, stuff goes sour, you know, it's going to happen. Jesus said in the world, you will have trouble. Not might, not could have some. No, he said you will have trouble. You know, even in the parable of the sower, it says that persecution arises for the word's sake, like the sun. You know, the sun rises every day, right? Even, even if you can't see it, even though today was a cloudy day, the sun still rose. Every day there's going to be heat. Every day there's going to be pressure. Every day there's going to be trials. Every day there's going to be an attack. The devil hates your guts. And the world system is pitted against you. And yet, God's on your side. And you need to take your problems, your trials, your cares, and you need to cast them on the Lord because God cares for you. Second thing is this. Remind yourself of who God is by declaring his goodness. Remember, David said, but wait, hold on a second. God, you're my shield. God, you're the one who lifts my head. So what did he do? He reminded himself of who God is. See, when you start looking at God, you're no longer looking at the problem. When you start looking at God, you're no longer looking at something that is a problem. You're looking at the solution. God is the solution. There's no government, no president, no elected official. There's no legislation. There's no dollar. There's no deed. There's no person. There, there's no uh, happenstance. Nothing else is going to take care of the issue. God is the one who is the solution. So if you're in a slump, if you're praying and you're concerned, start reminding of yourself of who God is. This is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. This is the one the grave couldn't hold. This is the one the devil couldn't stop. This is the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's my God and that's your God. And is there anything impossible for our God? See, when you start looking at God, now the impossible situation suddenly looks like a piece of cake. Why? Because... Look at who my God is. Look at who I'm in relation. Look at who I'm in covenant with. That's quite a different word, isn't it? I'm in a bound agreement. We're one now. I'm his and he's mine. Everything that I have is his. Everything he has is mine. What resource do you need when you have God on your side? It's all available to you. See, you're no longer looking at the natural. You're looking at the supernatural. Then rest in his power to take care of you. See, King David, he said, once he started thinking about God, once he started crying out to the Lord, and he knew God heard his prayer, now he said, I can rest. I can go to sleep, and I can wake up. I won't be afraid of tens of thousands of people that are coming against me. Listen, there literally was a battle that was coming at him with tens of thousands of people. You can read this story in the book of 2 Samuel. Tens of thousands coming against him, and yet his men whipped him. His son Absalom, who was coming against him, got himself caught in a tree. See, David didn't have to fight the battle. David was kept in the city. They said, David, don't go out to battle with us. They'll chase you and they won't come after us. So we'll go fight the battle. You stay in the city. David literally rested and did nothing. God fought the battle for him. 
See, and sometimes we think, oh, I have to go out there, I have to do all this stuff, and we get this nervous energy, and we say, well, I gotta make it happen. Now, you know, I prayed, but, but God, you know, God blesses those who bless themselves. God helps those who help themselves. No, rest in faith, believing that God is gonna take care of it. If God tells you to do something, go do it. But if God says, sit still, sit still. If God says, relax, I've got this, go take a nap. Be like David, get a good eight hours and wake up rested and refreshed. Why? Because you don't have to fear when God is on your side. Finally is this, ask for what you need from him. What did King David cry out at the very end? God, save me. For salvation belongs to God. Do you know you can ask God for anything that belongs to him? If you can find it in his word, then you can ask him for it. If you can find a promise of God, then you can pray in the promise in your life. If, if you know that God has a will or a desire for your life, then you can ask him for it. Whatever it is you need. Maybe some of you guys need saving. Maybe you got yourself in some trouble. Maybe there's people coming after you. That's not uncommon these days. You can ask God to save you and to deliver you. Maybe you need God to deliver you from drugs or addiction or alcohol or pornography or something like that. Listen, God's not shocked by your sin. God has the power to save. He can deliver you in an instant or he can deliver you throughout your lifetime. But however he chooses to do that, he's God, we're not, we need to follow him and therefore we need to ask him to do it. Sometimes we're afraid to do it. God, what if I mess up again? Then you messed up. Listen, is that gonna break the bank of heaven? Is that sap the strength of the blood of Jesus? No. God says, bring it to me. Bring it to me. The blood is enough to cover sin, to cover every stain, every stumble. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Ask him for it. Ask him for provision. Sometimes we feel guilty asking God to provide for our lives. God wants to provide for your life. He wants to be your source, like we mentioned. God wants to be the one that gets the praise and the glory. Why? Because he's deserving of it. He's worthy of it. He's not an egotist. He's not a maniacal maniac up in heaven wanting people to come to him just because that makes him feel good about himself. No, he's perfect. He, he knows that he deserves it. And therefore, when we worship him, when we give him glory and praise, it's fitting because he's God. That's how it should be. I should have had a bigger amen than that. But God is good. 